municipality. But like most SDG, it also uh, what do you call it? Correlates with many other SDGs. For example, with you know um, re SDG 10, reduce inequalities. Uh, with SDG 1, no poverty. Uh, eight, decent work and economic growth. And as a uh, father to two daughters and and wife also, I think for me is SDG 16, uh, peace uh, and justice. Uh, so we have a a, a panelist of fantastic uh, speakers. Uh, but before we, we kick off the, the panel, I just want to just share a few things. Uh, a few housekeeping rules. If you could ask everybody on the call to mute their microphones and turn off their cameras so we can spotlight the speakers. Uh, you can ask questions in a link that we, have, we are sharing. Uh, it's a Menti link. When you click the link, let me just share my screen. Just a minute. When you click the link, uh, you will see this, this uh, Ask Me Anything screen do you see my screen yes so you ask me anything click ask a question you can type your question any your question that you want click submit then you will see the question come up at the main bar and you can click like if you like that question so the idea is the up the most upvoted questions we will ask during the uh, moderated q a session right so the link is shared. Uh, with that, I pass. Uh, I would just like to in briefly introduce our uh, wond wonderful moderator for the day, Dato Alia. Dato Alia is a women's icon Malaysia 2019. At, uh, also, she's an advisor to the executive board hospita hospitality, the former CEO and advisor of MAA Medicare Charitable Foundation, and, and an advisor of Tulips uh, Movement. So, without further over ado, over to you, uh, Dato. Thank you. Thank you, Farouz, and good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning, Malaysia. It's Labor Day, and I'm sure by now you're used to, you know, having your official meetings and Zoom sessions and Skype sessions, you know, but here we are today. Um, I promise you that for this one hour at least, uh, the conversation will not be very meeting-like, but more on a discussion, a healthy discussion uh, that we're going to have. So once again, if you're just joined us, good morning, Malaysia, and good evening, New York. Thank you for joining us today. And uh, this exclusive webinar is actually brought to you by the United Nations Global and uh, supported by Tulips Movement. Now, the United Nations has become the foremost forum to address issues that transcend national boundaries, which cannot be resolved by one single country acting alone. The United Nations has 17 sustainable development goals to transform our world. One of these goals is the SDG or the Sustainable Development Goal 5, which is gender equality. With me today are three eminent panelists. All female, I must tell you, this is done on purpose to discuss some pertinent issues involving empowering women the boost in productivity at the workplace, equality, and some strategies to help you, um, those of you who are listening in, to understand and also seek advice on how to achieve these goals, which will be discussed um, later on with our three eminent panelists. So without further ado and delay, I shall read their bio data, which is actually very, very long. All three of them have, you know, extensive work done over the years. But if you would go to their respective LinkedIn's, you know, um, I'm sure you can read the entire bio. But since we are trying to keep it short, uh, since we're trying to keep it short, I will start with uh, the very lovely lady in the black hat this morning. Um, she's Datuk Noripa Kamso, a household name in the banking Islamic business and finance. She's the former chairman of Bank Kerjasama Rakyat Malaysia and the former advisor of CIMB Islamic. She was with the CIMB group from the early 90s to 2014 and held various key positions. She is the founding CEO of CIMB Principal Islamic Asset Management and in 2019, she was ranked number one by Cambridge IFA as the most influential woman in Islamic business and finance. While in 2018, she was awarded the top 50 of the world's most prominent and influential personalities in Islamic finance and economy in Islamica 500, a publisher in Belgium. 
She was also the co-chair of Islamic Finance Council at the Malaysian US Chamber of Commerce based in Washington DC and a visiting fellow in Islamic Finance at the Oxford Center of Islamic Studies. She has authored two books, Investing in Islamic Funds and Credit Decisions Making, a Qualitative Approach. Hello, Dr. Noripa, and thank you for coming Hello. on board. Good morning. Good morning, Dr. Noripa. Thank you for joining us this morning. And uh, I'm thanking you in advance for all the advice that you're about to give to us later on, yeah? From Malaysia, I know most of you have not traveled anywhere for the past six weeks or so. So let's take a flight and go meet and say hello to Odd Kokatrix, who is in New York. And she's the senior manager of the United Nations Global Compact, the world's largest voluntary corporate sustainability initiative. Odd joined the UN Global Compact in March 2019 and co-leads the initiative's gender equality portfolio of work, including management of the Women's Empowerment Principles, a joint platform with the United Nations Women focused on corporate action to empower women in the workplace, marketplace and community. Odd is a practicing lawyer who also serves as the legal counsel for the foundation for the United Global Compact. Prior to that, Odd was the Deputy Director of the Donor Direct Action Fund, a US-based fund strengthening women's rights organizations around the world by increasing access to financial resources, political leaders, and public visibility. Good morning from Malaysia to good night, Odd. <laughs> it's good evening there. Welcome and thank you for, having, uh, for joining us today. Good morning, everyone. And I mean, good evening from here. Yeah. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor uh, to be a panelist uh, tonight. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Right, I'm sure everyone, uh, we have purchased a, a written air ticket. So from New York, we're going back to Malaysia to say hello to our very own Raja Azura Raja Mayuddin, bringing with her over 20 years of experience in the field of capital, human capital, audit and nation building. She was the former CEO of Pernaraju Foundation for seven years, providing quality education, training and development programs. She previously served Malaysian Airlines, Kazana National Berhad and Arthur Anderson, navigating audit and human capital portfolios. She's currently appointed as an independent, non-executive director of chemical company of Malaysia Berhad and as chairman of the board of Sim Tijara Holdings Sindrian Berhad. She is a multi award winner and as a strong advocate in women empowerment and excellence, she is, inspires women to take on leadership challenges. She is currently my accomplice as the advisor of the Tolips movement. Welcome, Azura. Welcome. Thank you, Dato. Um, happy to be here. Happy Thank to be sharing as well. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. And well, we won't waste much time. Um, let's kick, kick start with a very, very simple question. You know, that's uh, and it's very, very interesting. We talk about gender equality. Um, we've, you know, we've heard it so often. In fact, SDG five is gender equality. What do you think um, is gender? What's what's gender equality when it comes to you know? I we all understand. You know, when a lot of people have this conception or it might be a misconception when we say gender equality means a uh, woman fighting for their rights to be 50 50 with men how true is that or i'll start this one off uh, with you thank you so much uh Elia, and uh, thank you everyone uh, so yes that's uh, that's that that's a very very good question uh, as Faro's uh, mentioned already earlier, um, the UN Global Compact is the largest corporate so um, social responsibility initiative of the world uh, and was launched uh, 20 years ago by Kofi Annan. And uh, when Kofi Annan um, started the Global Compact, he explained that he was creating it to bring business and the UN together to give a human face to the global market. Um, so our goal is to mobilize a global movement of sustainable companies and, and stakeholders to really create the world we want. 
And you already all described the SDGs and you mentioned SDG 5 around uh, gender equality. So uh, really gender equality is not only about women asking 50% 50, 50 rights. Um, because we have this uh, 30, 30, 30, um, sorry, 2030 agenda that's our shared blueprint for peace, prosperity, the people and the planet. And actually gender equality, SDG 5, has been recognized and presented as a necessary milestone to achieve all other goals, which means that we are not going to reach any other uh, sustainable development goals uh, such as ending poverty, education, for uh, climate action, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, if we don't reach gender equality. Uh, and as the UN Secretary General uh, put it like very lightly, uh, rightly, he said, gender equality is a moral duty and an operational necessity. So it's way beyond uh, women asking just 50 50 percent rights and complaining uh, and so on and, and, and so forth. Um, and when it comes to business and, and, and you know what gender equality means to business, because that's what we want to talk about tonight, right? Uh, the business case for gender equality is clear. Women's participation and leadership in business has been proven essential to drive economic and financial performance. In fact, studies shows that companies with high female representation have annual returns that are 2.8 percentage points higher, which is really notable and and beyond if you want to come to talk about the broader economic case it is estimated that 28 trillion dollars would be added to global gdp by 2025 through investments in gender equality so these numbers are just striking and it's way beyond women asking for 50 50 and it's just like gender equality is the smart thing to do for business okay Thank, thank you. That's interesting to see that the figures and the amount that, that's been pumped in or is going to be pumped in is really, really humongous, helping to boost this, yeah? The, helping to boost the agenda, all right? So why then do we still think that we haven't reached the equal status? Azura, you might want to take on that question. Why do you think we haven't reached the equal status? Okay, uh, maybe maybe I will look at it from a different, not really different, uh, from a leadership perspective. Um, when we when we talk about uh, gender equality and when we talk about what the the topic today um, leadership for uh, we are looking at uh, the effort that have been put through for Malaysia. Uh, I looked at some uh, details before. You can see that the the government have started to take uh, on the initiative in uh, and that is actually meant for public servant. Uh, and I think within um, 14 years, 13 years, we have actually achieved about 36% just for public sectors. Uh, but when we look at the totality, it is now about 24%, uh, for which are uh, still struggling to ensure that uh, the participation will be higher at a uh, private sector. If you look at uh, about 15.7% uh, total, uh, which uh, we, we have started slightly later as well because like uh, the 30% club all only started around uh, 2015. Um, if we were to look at Malaysia as well, uh, there, there are some other factors that we have to consider. Um, one is about the culture. We, we can see uh, when we talk about women, usually um, we are very reserved. We don't go to the front to really uh, want to take up challenge. Uh, that, that is Malaysian kind of culture as well. Right. Um, religion can be a factor as well. Um, we, we know that um, in certain religions, like, like Islam earlier, it was mentioned that usually men will be the leader. Uh, but there are many scholars have then come into play to also talk about it and um, actually debate about that as well. I, I can't really uh, go and dwell into the detail because um, I, I don't think I qualify to, to go on that uh, aspect. And the other one is perception itself. Uh, as usually, uh, as women, when we when we talk about leadership, you will always have men in mind, lah. Yeah, men in mind, and then we say, uh, you know, we want to get to that level. But things have started to change. That is what we have been seeing uh, happening in Malaysia, uh, and this is a journey. And I trust, like um, Art, you mentioned about 2030. I really hope that Malaysia will be able to go through the journey and beat the 30% as what has been uh, said earlier. 
Okay. Well, before I continue, can I please ask the attendees to kindly turn off your cameras and also mute your mics? Yes, please help us to do that because there's some interference and uh, this will allow everyone to hear the panelists even clearer. Thank you. Right, let's go on to our next question. So we've sort of spoken about the understanding on gender equality. You understood a little bit about um, what United Nations is you know, doing and how seriously they are actually taking gender equality and the rest of the SDGs uh, you know, to the forefront. And then obviously we also asked, uh, or I, I asked about, you know, why is it that we haven't reached the eco status? And, you know, Azura gave from a point of uh, view in, uh, from a Malaysian perspective on why she felt that, you know, the eco status was not reached. And yes, I am on the same page with you. I'm hoping that I don't even want to wait for 2030. I want, it, want us to reach way before 2030 because we've got this huge uh, talent pool out there of women, yeah? Right, so like going to the next question, Dato Noripa, this one's going out to you. If we're going through a crisis, as you know now, you know, it's, uh, you, you know, the whole world's going through a crisis. What's the importance of gender equality in the workforce to help boost the productive growth? Yeah, we are actually talking about the crisis now, which, you know, is COVID-19. So moving forward, how important is gender equality um, in the workforce? to boost the productivity. Thank you, thank you, Dato. Um, it's really um, interesting when both the speakers um, identify that there is really a hidden bias towards women as we uh, uh, progress towards this discussion today. In fact, it's very important when you talk about productivity, we talk about an economic tool for the, so maybe this topic should be called an economic equality instead of uh, gender in equality or maybe uh, gender mainstreaming. Okay, so the question is about uh, how to have this <clears throat> economic equality in the workforce to boost productivity. I'm going to take it from a, a more liberal angle. Um, I think what we have forgotten is to collaborate with the men, to share with the men. You know, women can actually leave the world. There are about 60 million girls that doesn't go to school. If we, if we are able to leave the world, we are lifting the society. And when we talk about society, we're talking about men and women, which will be lifted. And when we talk about lifting the women, we'll be lifting the family. And when we leave the family units, um, there are shared goals with the men, shared vision, shared values, shared responsibility, shared hopes, and even shared prosperity. So if you have a good, happy woman and happy society and happy man, you will have a happy workplace. And that itself is, is, is productivity. So that's from the perspective of individual. But from perspective of an organization, I think it's important for most organizations to explore uh, maternity and also the paternity leave so that productivity can be uh, post-crisis. We can take the example of Bill Gates. He will take the initiative to send his two girls to school every morning and then pass back his house and go to his Google office while Melinda finishes some of the housework. So what we see here is collaboration to the extent that even in Google, the maternity leave of five months is uh, complemented with a three months paternity leave. So that will encourage the productivity uh, uh, and, and make sure the economic equality is also being supported as you collaborate with the men. Okay, yes, so we understand a little bit better now maybe from your point of view where you are looking at, you know, over, overall happiness, you know, in order to achieve productivity as well. So basically you're saying when they're happy, they are more productive, and, you know, and uh, I think one thing that you asked and was hoping that people would explore further was the maternity and uh, uh, paternity leave. 
Uh, yes, and uh, this is if you're talking about post-COVID, uh, I think there are lots of, you know, jokes going out there that there will be an increase in baby boom in 2021 since there has been a lockdown for quite some time. So I would think that maternity and paternity leave would come in handy. Yeah, right. Let's move on to the, you know, to the next, um, you know, question. Um, Post-COVID again, you know, what are some gender eccentric challenges that you predict uh, may arise. Yes, um, generally we are talking about the challenges that, uh, you know, in a, in a productive place, in an organization, in large companies, um, regardless where you are, when you have this group of women and men both, you know, working and moving forward, you will find that, you know, there's a lot of fear out there that everyone's saying about pay cuts, losing jobs, and, you know, uh, some women out there are even saying that priority will be given to men. You know, the woman will be the one laid off. What's, what's your take on this? Raja Azura, what's your take on this? Yeah. I, I think there are a few uh, things that we have to look into and understand uh, from the perspective of women when it comes to uh, post-COVID-19. Um, we, we, uh, the women, uh, majority, uh, the mother and all, they have... Uh, been in the multitasking beyond norms. That, that, that is what I can see when it comes to post-COVID uh, situation, doing more than what they, they, they can do. At the same time, uh, in their mind, they have the unknown unknown. What's next will happen to me? Um, many things come into mind. And the other part, I think, especially for those uh, single mother and those who may be living independently as well, uh, is the issue of survival survivability, uh, what will happen after this. And um, this is something that need to be looked into because it impacts the mental health, it impacts the um, uh, stress level of uh, many individuals, especially uh, the women. Uh, and also, they, they don't have the clarity of situation. And this is where I think as employers or people out there who are in power, or can make decision to see how exactly we want to handle this. Um, knowing the vulnerability that uh, they are facing, uh, I think it is very, very important to see post-COVID how exactly we want to manage the transition uh, of these people. There need to be a, very, a, a frank conversation happening uh, with uh, all the employ uh, employees, especially we are, we are talking about women as well. And women with emotion, you know, it, it has to be handled carefully and it has to be handled properly to make sure that they be able to uh, accept it better. They need to be um, a journey of exception uh, by, by this party and also to see how exactly um, a, a win-win situation can be uh, put into play. Uh, understanding both the uh, situation of the employer and the employee. People need to know that there will not be the normal things happening again after COVID-19. Uh, so uh, things need to be very clear and see how exactly to manage the transition and what are the plans forward. So many parties need to come together, I think the government, uh, the, uh, all the employers, and also getting the employee to understand this, the, the real situation because people will still be expecting they're getting their salary, their full salary at the end of the month. It's not going to happen. So the new normal that we are talking about and how is it to manage it. And the company needs to start looking at changing their policies, because some companies said, you can only work for me now, no. You know, the economy is coming, so yeah. different things will happen, you know. So so these are the things that, you know, many people, all the parties need to uh, take action and see how exactly they want to uh, implement things differently moving forward. But frank conversation is important. Okay, thank you. Or, um, you know, I'm sure the impact is even on a greater, much bigger aspect in um, US, yes, because you have got over uh, a million cases with uh, 63,000 63, deaths so far. And in fact, New York has, you know, the highest numbers with uh, 310,000 of these cases actually coming from New York and uh, 23,000 deaths, if I'm not mistaken, as of yesterday, out of the 63,000 is actually from uh, you know, New York based, yeah. So I'm sure the impact compared to Malaysia is going to be larger or even, you know, uh, more substantial. Um, what's your take on this? What's 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 happening there? Share with us a little on uh, 
how is this going to have an impact um, with this gender um, equation and is this going to shape any figures, numbers, or is it going to be like a fair thing across the board? Have you heard anything? Sorry, I couldn't unmute myself. Uh, thank you, Lee. Of course, um, no, of course, it's going to shake uh, many things, actually. And the impact on women here in the US and, and actually around the world is uh, huge. Uh, it's already been established, actually, that, that women have been uh, disproportionately hit by the, by the pandemic. And uh, actually, from many, many, many different aspects here in New York, in the US, in Europe, and everywhere. Like, for instance, here the figures are that 70%, uh, I read it again two days ago, 70%, around 70% of the frontline health workers risking their lives are women. So, just that figure only is like speaks volumes. Uh, and when it comes to an employment crisis, I mean, you just, you know, like you probably saw the numbers that only in New York, we have 3 million people fighting for unemployment, like over the past four weeks, uh, which is unprecedented. And uh, women, women are paying a high price because it's been established that they earn less, they save less, and they are more likely to work in insecure jobs, especially in the States. Um, 60% I've read uh, women's um, employment in the informal economy here uh, with very few, uh, with limited access to social protection, if any, and job insecurity. Uh, of course, the gender pay gap in the US exists and across like uh, the border, I've read like the latest ILO release by the ILO is that it's stuck at around 16%. And in some countries, it's 35. And of course, it leaves women more vulnerable to economic downturn. Uh, not to mention that the service industry has been, uh, you know, um, striking the most. And uh, over 50% of the workers, there are women, 88% in the G7 countries. So all this is just like the world is never going to be the same. I think it's going to be harder for women to find new jobs because most of them you know, uh, lost everything. And it's true that there's this unconscious bias from employers. Yeah. That they, and that's, that's a reality. We have to all face it. Like, especially now with all the burden related to childcare, etc. I bet you that many employers are going to choose men over women. Um, I'm not even talking about domestic violence that's increased by 25% around the world due to lockdowns which is extremely frightening, especially when women here in New York and everywhere don't have access anymore to preventive services and hotlines, etc. Um, so, so, yeah, I hope this answers your question, but I don't think the world will be the same. And I think this is time for us to double down our, effort, our, our efforts on gender equality. It's not time to slow down. It has to be a priority right now, and the, the Secretary General some elected officials here in the US have already called on companies and everyone to put women at the center of the recovery efforts. And this is going to be crucial. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Moderator, can I just, can I just add uh, to what Ort has just mentioned? Sure, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. What, what, <clears throat> what has COVID taught us? COVID it has taught us not to focus on non-essential. We therefore need to focus on essential. So, so just to add to what Odd has been uh, mentioning, if we actually look at the stimulus packages, which is split into life and livelihood, the part on life and death is focusing on essential. Is focusing on on the the agriculture. So where I'm coming from is if a woman who lost their job or if they're a woman who wants to respond to essential, they need to focus into being job creators now instead of job seekers. And as job creators, as you focus is to it, the essential business, the woman might want to focus on two things, which are food security and health care security. So as you talk about food security, we should start getting a woman 
into agriculture, in, into fishing, into all the essentials, and the same with the health. Um, just to add and support what Court, uh, Court has been saying. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yes, I think that that figure that you gave just now, or uh, 25 percent, you know, in domestic violence, we've been hearing it, uh, you know, quite a bit here as well. But I, I honestly didn't realize that the figure was, I mean, the the percentage was that high. And you know, um, let's hope this lockdown, you know, is not going to be locked down very much longer for the safety, yeah, of all the women uh, out there, especially those who are, you know, under um, a very heavy fist. I must say, you know, in the some households. Right. Um, and yes, um, uh, Dato Noripa was also adding on. Um, I agree with you that you need to, you know, look a little bit extra, a little bit out of the box in that sense. And uh, it, you can't run away from these two focus areas, which is obviously the food and the medical. And, you know, women being women, I mean, they, they, they tend not to look after just themselves, but for the entire family. Yeah. So I see uh, quite a bit of questions, you know, coming um, into the box. I will soon attend to your questions, um, but I have a very, um, very popular, I should say, very popular question out there that a lot of people are actually talking about for the past uh, few years. This is with regards to the percentage of, you know, 30% of women, uh, you know, requirements on uh, for Malaysia on board. I don't know what the percentage is, you know, with uh, uh, US, but I'm sure Odd will, you know, share with us some details. Um, I, uh, in Malaysia, we have this, we often hear, you know, about the 30% requirement for women to be on boards. And Dato Noripa and uh, Raja Azura are both board members. Yes, and um, recently we have been uh, very sad, as you know, as a woman empowerment person myself, you know, trying to empower women out there, more women on board. We have uh, received very, very sad and shocking news that many of the women on board, prestigious boards and, you know, intellectual women have been removed from boards. Um, you know, just in the past couple of weeks or past, you know, one month with the new um, I, I won't go into a political uh, uh, spark here, but I would say that it had obviously something to do with, with the new government. What's your What's your take on this? And uh, you know, how do we go about this? How, where do you see us going in the next five years? Do you think we will, you know, go and reach that thirty percent, or are you thinking that you know, look, I we 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 really don't think we can hit that thirty percent. What's your take on this? Uh, Dr. Noripa, you've been a very senior person on board and you were, you know, the former chairman as well of, you know, a, a large bank. So probably you can kickstart this one, you know, and put my mind at ease um, about the steady percenting. <laughs> I'm very troubled. <laughs> Moderator, I wish I have a crystal ball. It's a very <laughs> tough question, but we all know that 30 percent uh, woman on board has been institutionalized the foundation is there in fact in november and december i was really really proud to see that malaysia has more than 30 chairman chief in the glc government linked companies and the government linked investment companies um yes very sad we have moved a few thousand steps backward instead of forward but I think what we need to probably break, uh, how we can understand this is to break it into two. The previous government, when they actually put women on board of the C-suite, it was, I believe, based on a conscious effort to meet the 30%. But this new government is about that effort. Can, can you repeat what you just said? I'm sorry, Dr. Noripa, we couldn't hear you. Can you just repeat about the new government? Oh, uh, the, 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 new, the new government is not bothered about performance as well as uh, ability to lead. They're more interested in political patronage. But as they started to put their supporters 
on the board and on the chairmanship. By the way, it's a woman. It's not that I think, I think they were not conscious. It's they were not conscious that it's woman. I think it's more by the way it's woman. So um, we as women should not really feel like we I mean, in in a space of emotional empathy on this. Um, but I suppose your next question is, what is the solution? I couldn't think of any solution except for getting a woman as a prime minister in this country. You know, because the foundation has been there. We can bring the horse to drink. But if the new government decided not to drink, then we can't force them. Um, I suppose what I can add is highlighting again to um, to the uh, to the current leadership that the <clears throat> performance is a lot more important now than it was before because post covid we have got to look into remodeling reshaping the whole economic system needs people with integrity and that integrity, I do not know where it is now because under 17A, it has got to be implemented in June. I think it has been flushed down the toilet. So I don't have a solution, but I think I would want our leadership to probably read the book by Jack Zenger and I think Joseph Foucault. Um, they are consultants on um, uh, uh, hu uh, humanity. They actually rated that woman is higher and better than men in four categories. They had 11 or 12 categories. So the four categories that the women are really good at is one, leadership skill, two, resilience, three, self-driven, and four, they drive results. And these are the qualities that you actually need when you talk about a resilience economy post the pandemic. Okay. Sorry so, to disappoint you. No answer for you. No, no. <laughs> I mean, no solution. <laughs> it, yeah, yeah. It's all right. Raja Zara, do you have something to say on this before I move to Odd? Yeah, I think, I think to see there's a direct solution, I think it's pretty hard to, I agree with that. To, um, it's pretty hard to see that we have direct solution, but we cannot stop from uh, being the people who are going to push uh, this agenda forward. Um, one of the uh, few, few of the things that I can think of, um, like what I to mention as well, the foundation is already there. But how then do we do we, do we, do we want this agenda to actually uh, be pushed through? Uh, currently, what is happening? Um, it's pushing. We we try. We we need to try change it to be pulling, so that people who want women to be on board rather than you know, uh, they have to abide by the policy or whatnot. Uh, so. Uh, among things that we can do is actually looking at the diversity of uh, skills required in, uh, on, on, on the board. Uh, for example, I think now uh, many boards have uh, started to look at human capital as an important agenda. So people issue is important. So those with uh, CHRO experience and all, this is an opportunity that maybe we can, maybe we can look at. We have many uh, ladies CHRO uh, who would be able to then uh, then maybe be considered jumping to the um, board as well. Uh, technology is another area that maybe we want to start getting more women to be involved with because uh, if I were to look at many advertisements or many requests, um, now human capital technology has been among the areas that uh, is, uh, are required. Um, another thing that I want to start um, putting through as well is the age factor because we, we do see that Many women that came on board uh, or be the board members are around the category of, of 50 and above. Uh, we need to start having pipeline coming through. Uh, we, we can't just focus on those who are already at senior management level. I think this is where Tulips is trying to also be promoting. Uh, um, you want to start unleashing talent uh, from, from, from uh, young, younger age so that we can help build the pipeline to come on board. Uh, and, and get more women to become uh, board members. Um, and also, maybe um, trying to see how exactly women can support women. 
so uh, hashtag women for women yeah. yeah okay how how do you want to ensure that we will have more women supporting the agenda i think that's very important as well we have now uh, right. but now trying when we want to build the pipeline it's also trying to help not not just the senior management uh, members uh, who are women but also those at middle management and all start understanding and getting the awareness of this can be actually a a, a profession uh, in future right thank you raja azura or before i i can you just give me a very very quick summary on a cer certain numbers that we are talking about in us is there such a thing as a uh, a proportion in the board like you know do you have a certain percentage is there a composition um, um about the members in us thank you so uh actually i don't have numbers in mind when it comes to boards but i do have numbers in mind when it comes to ceos and executive managements right uh, and sadly it's not like we are performing better here uh, than the rest of the world quite okay. the opposite uh, the number of, of CEOs of uh, Fortune um, 500 Fortune companies dropped from 2018 to 2019, and it got back up a little bit between 2018 and 2019, only to reach 6.6 percent. So, needless to say, that this is ridiculous. And there was even a New York Times article back in 2018, and I'm not lying. The title was "The Top Jobs Where Women Are Outnumbered by Men." Named John. There were more main men named John than female CEOs in the Fortune 500 companies. No joke. Oh. So this is just to say that there is a long, long way to go here uh, too. There is no uh, legal framework, sadly, in the US in terms of uh, any regulations like uh, or even incentive to push companies to put more women um, towards an executive management. So we are trying to change that in the UN. Uh, pretty much so. So we are working with member states uh, to really raise awareness, get them on board, making the business and economic case for more women on boards. That you know, 30% women on boards equals like usually six percentage points more in return. So it's huge. Uh, more and more states are on board. You know, we have some, as you know, probably very positive legislation in Europe, especially the Nordic countries. Uh, France is performing very well. We, on average, I think we're at 45% of women on board. So, you know, some countries are really like pioneers, which gives yeah. me a lot of hope for the future. They need to be like, uh, they need to just like create a movement. We're working on it. Uh, and I know you need a short answer, so I'm going to stop here. But just as a very quick closing remarks, we launched an initiative at the Global Compact yeah. called Target Gender Equality. Uh, and it's really about not only helping companies to set corporate, uh, ambitious corporate targets uh, when it comes to women's representation, but it's also about creating an enabling environment, getting government, civil society, <laughs> companies together to remove the barriers. Right. Uh, yeah. Okay, we have, we have heaps of questions that have come in, but just before I attend to these questions, I think, uh, Dr. Noripa, can you please uh, for the benefit of some of them who have asked um, can you tell me the name of the book again that you were mentioning that people should read the two books oh when you're talking about books i can give you a whole lot of names so, uh, the two names the two names that you mentioned just now oh that's by um that that book is by that's on that's on woman leadership. Oh, by Jack. That's Jack Zinger. Okay. Uh, J A C K Z E N G E R. Right. Amma, I hope uh, the person who asked this. Yes, I hope you've got that name. Uh, Dr. Moderator, while we are talking about books, I would encourage to read books that's written by. Um, uh, the COO of uh, Facebook. Uh, um, um, what's 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 her, what's her name again? It's it, the heading is Lean In. Cheryl Cheryl Sandberg. Yeah. Yeah. Cheryl yeah, Sandberg. Sandberg. When in in the book she talks about women work and the will to lead. But there's also an interesting book. Don't be a nice girl. You should actually be a. a, a, a an indigenous girl. So 
There are two books on nice girls. Nice girls don't get the corner office. And nice girls just don't get it. So there's two books on nice girls. Okay. So I, I, okay. Since we have so many questions, I'm not going to be very nice. I'm so sorry I have to cut you off. Um, let's go into the first question so that I can come back to you again. Okay, so right. One of the questions here is that how do we solve or handle women who are in power but didn't help or I, I think it's uh, but don't help other women. It is kind of a competition between women to win over in a working environment rather than a healthy workplace. Does it resonate with anyone in particular? <laughs> Yeah, you cannot respond based on example. I think you need to take the example of quite a number of international women and just that on Ripa, just before you just before you answer, I will tell you that there are umpteen questions here. Yeah? So I'm not going to ask the opinion of every one of our panelists so that we can cover more questions. All right. So I hope that's fine with everyone because everyone wants their question <laughs> answered. So Dr. Noripa, if you want to take this on, how do we solve the handle women who are in power but do not want to help other women? Um, just two example, I think it's very important to highlight how some uh, instead of uh, highlighting why they don't help, I think it's important to highlight how some women help. You might want to refer to Hillary Clinton when she was in the fourth woman in Shanghai in 1995. The words resonates in me until today. She said human rights is woman rights. And ever since then, she has started creating the Hilton Foundation uh, to support human rights, which is woman rights. And uh, secondly, we need to see the many women ministers and prime ministers internationally. Let's forget a little about the ministers in Malaysia. I, I have been looking up at Mary Robinson, the, the former Prime Minister of Ireland, for example. I remember she did mention that I was appointed that role to do jobs differently from yeah. men before me, you know. So I think we need to create quite a number of success factors and success example, and that would be able to motivate some of the women who is resisting this. Okay, thank you. Um, I hope that answers your question. The next question, Raja Azura, you might want to take this. Uh, I personally think women from the private sector are more actively involved in equality compared to women in the civil sector. Could it be the restrictions on bureaucracy causing this? Um, do you agree? Do you beg to differ? Um, if you were to talk about a public sector not actively looking into equality, I I beg to differ, I think, uh, considering the percentage of women uh, holding all the decision making position is about 36%. There are bureaucracy, but I know that there are many um, initiatives that have been put through uh, in public uh, public sector to ensure that that can happen. In public, uh, in private sector, um, it is pretty new in terms of, not, not really to say pretty new, lah, but we have a 30% club, we have a um, lead woman and all in place, but that one is Pretty, pretty later, I think uh, the percent club is a 20, 2015, I think, uh, being established in Malaysia. And I know that there are many other uh, private sectors who are really preaching and trying to get this happen. Um, let's try to see how we can support all this initiative together. I think we have to work, uh, we, we have to have our own movement to make it happen. Lah. So yeah. let's move together and ensure that this can happen uh, proactively. Okay. Uh, or there's a question for you. How can we help educate families and schools to start teaching their kids to focus on equality? Because personally, uh, the person who asked the question personally believes that these are characters that we all need to build from young. Right? So they're talking about helping to educate families and schools to start teaching their kids to focus on equality because personally they believe that these characters uh, need to be built from young. Absolutely, I could not agree more. Uh, I'm happy because this is really something that, you know, more and more uh, member states uh, organization realize and, um, and uh, at the UN, especially with UNICEF, 
we are implementing uh, programs and I'm partnering with UN Women programs specially dedicated to education uh, of very, very young children about gender equality. We're really trying to, to, uh, to create a shift in, you know, the cultural norm. And it has to happen from the younger age because we are looking at like, like the future generations have, you know, the, like it's in their hands, basically. We can only reverse so much us now, but I think we're only going to achieve true progress if we start with kids. And actually, very quickly, uh, when it comes, sadly, to sexual violence and gender-based violence in countries like that are particularly hit, like the Congo, I'm just, um, I was working on it like, in my previous job, uh, this is one of the top priorities of the UN and civil society. It's to educate young boys on gender equality, respecting women, etc. And they're already like great results. It's a very tangible example. Uh, example, sorry. So yes, I agree with you. Education is key. Right. Uh, Dr. Noripa, a question. If there's one advice, one key advice, what would it be? in achieving equitable empowerment, regardless of gender, but more on merit. If there is one key advice, what would your advice be to all of you know the listeners out there this morning in achieving equitable empowerment, regardless of gender, but more on merit? Get a mentor and make sure the mentor is a man. <laughs> Okay, that's a that 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 is taught many men. <laughs> that, that's a very 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 good uh, answer, which you know I heard someone say, yeah, say uh, you know along those same lines. So yes, so to you know the person asked a question out there, yes, um, please get yourself a mentor and please get a man as your mentor, yeah, right. And uh, now that the normal will mostly be working from home. How would this improve equal opportunities, diversity, and inclusion? Or that's a question for you. Now that the normal will mostly be working from home, how would this improve equal opportunities, diversity, and inclusion? Well, that's a good question. I think that we mostly need to make sure that it doesn't um, that it just like it doesn't affect diversity and inclusion uh, before like making sure that it improves it uh, because as i was saying before like the impact on of covid-19 is certainly to exacerbate uh, inequalities whether it's gender or it's it's you know like with when it relates to religion race etc so uh, so i i think we just need to make sure that all the actors of society work together that we all raise awareness on the risk of uh, the pandemic and that we have to take into account uh, diversity and inclusion in our new reality. Uh, more specifically, when it comes to businesses, um, we at the UN Global Compact encourage businesses to adopt the women's empowerment principles. And one of the aspects of the, of the principles is, of course, to encourage diversity, right. gender and beyond. Uh, and yes, it's it's one instrument, but 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 I think like like awareness and, and dialogue is key. We, we we really need to make sure we don't step back when it comes to diversity and, and inclusion. And um, and I think this crisis is also a rare chance to rewrite the narrative, shift the norm, and, and just build back better and, and you know better gender inclusive and inclusive in general, stronger and better. Okay. Oh. Thank you very much. Or did, did you, is there a specific numbers or, um, you know, in your women empowerment principles? How many are there that, you know, it's uh, recently been drawn up, I, I believe, in uh, by your side? Uh, so the women's empowerment principles, it's our initiative with UN Women. It's a set of seven principles right. that so, are in international human rights standards. And we launched the principles 10 years ago. Okay. And from 39 signatories, then we have over almost 3,000 CEOs who signed a statement of support to the principle. So it's uh, there's really a global movement that's, uh, that's yeah, on the way. Fantastic. Right. To all those listening in, I thank you very much. But please hold on because uh, the Unite, my friends from the UNGC will actually be requesting you to do a poll, which we will share, you know, some results. It's only five questions and it's very, very quick. 
and you might you know be surprised at the answers that we are going to share with you on a much later note but having said that i you know uh, before i sign off i'd like to thank the uh, panelists this morning and of course to all uh, you know it's night in, in new york um, if there's a few things that you know that we can take away from today's um, messages and advice and you know sharing, I think I liked the woman helping woman. Obviously, um, you know, woman for woman, woman helping woman, and I think the one of the key things that everyone was chatting away in the box was to uh, a reminder that not to focus on the women who are not helping the women, but to focus on the women who are actually helping on women, because there are many, many women out there, even the Tulips woman is, you know, also helping, um, you know, lots of women out there. So if you find that there are women women who are not helping you go towards the women who are helping you because there's just too many of us out there who are more than happy to you know help you and uh, i think the other thing was uh, for those of you who need mentors um you know uh, look where the focus is and choose the right mentor whether regardless to me whether it's a man or a um, woman in particular and as we move forward and That's we go moderator back, yes Make sure you don't look for mentor that just go for beautiful faces, yeah. <laughs> make sure the mentor, make sure the mentor respect your brain, your fiduciary duty, your authentic power where you build soul and you touch on life. <laughs> okay, so yes, so please make sure that when you, uh, okay, um, words of wisdom from the wise, uh, <laughs> do not get mentors uh, based on looks. OK, so maybe you might want to do some, you know, some simple tests or something to ensure that that's the right mentor for those, you. Those are mentors for ash dividends. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so point uh, noted and taken. Uh, OK, I, I'm sure, you know, uh, Datuk was just uh, kidding me this morning, uh, you know, uh, as usual. So, yeah, so these were the these are the few things. And uh, Faros, if you are around, um, before I sign off, and I thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and I am going to hand this session back to Faros, uh, the ED of UNGC Malaysia. Faros, all yours. Thank you, Dato. Thank you, fellow uh, panelists, for such a wonderful uh, webinar with some very, very interesting questions with great insights. Um, so for the participants, if you could just bear with us for another few minutes, we'd just like to run a live poll to get your insights uh, to better prepare us for future programs as well. Uh, so we have just posted a link uh, to our online uh, live poll. Uh, if you see the chat box, there is a Menti link that Afif have just posted. If you can kindly click on the link, it will take you to a set of questions. Now, uh, just click the, the answers that best suit you and click Submit. Uh, we have a series of five uh, five to six questions will take less than five minutes i promise so can we just go to the first question here just click uh, the most appropriate response that you want and you will see the live uh, change of uh, this uh, submission as well on on the shared screen So let's give another 10 seconds for any last minute uh, submissions. Okay, let's move to the next question, please. Last five seconds.
Thank you. Next question. Last five seconds. Thank you. Next question, please. Panelists and moderators also answering. Please. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Most yes. welcome. <laughs> yes, yes, I've been answering. <laughs> no, I was not answering. It's okay, you still got one more to go. <laughs> Enhancing paternity role. That's very interesting. Yeah, actually, I wanted to say earlier that, and I forgot, <laughs> that we definitely encourage companies to uh, to find flexible work arrangements for parents right. and include paid parental leave, paid sick leave, and emergency leaves as well. And there's a long way to go in the US. And the more reason now post-COVID, because um, yeah. brick and motor business is out, so it's all working at home. We need exactly. to really enhance the paternity. Exactly. And women are doing three times more unpaid and domestic work than men. So it also, I mean, most of it falls on women's shoulders. Statistically, if we actually calculate the total unpaid woman that washes plates at home, it is the same amount of one year of GDP of China. <laughs> oh, God. Wow. I didn't know this one. 4.5 so, hours a day of housework times 2 million of population, 2 billion of women population, and then you multiply by probably uh, 5 US dollars per hour, that's the GDP of China. Wow, sobering, sobering uh, statistics. Thank yeah. you, Dato, for sharing that. You, okay. you, you need to enhance the paternity to reduce that 4.5 hours per day to probably just 2 hours, yeah? It's right. unpaid job. Very so we'll go to the next question as well. <laughs> this is the second last question after we're done. They're all important. <laughs> can we keep can, can we keep all of them? <laughs> That's why we asked most important. So we can have a few yeah. things to focus on. <laughs> I cannot click. I'm like Oh, don't worry. When you click, it will come uh, a second later. It will just pop up. I'm okay, definitely not a millennial. The last five seconds for this one before we go to the last question. Okay, can we go to the last question, please? Oh. 
Interesting. Yes, I would have I would have gone for women are promoted less. Yeah. <laughs> But you know what? It's all the, it's exactly the topic of Sheryl Sanders' book. I mean, one of the main topics you were referring to the Lean In book, uh, Noipa earlier. Mm-hmm. It's uh, it's exactly yeah. that. Um, yeah. If I can if I can quickly quote an example on fear of asking for more pay or, or women are promoted less. Uh, uh, odd. I was in Edinburgh in November for United Nations Roundtable under the United Nations Development uh, 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 UNDP. In that round table, we have everybody around the world. So I was sitting at the head of the table, one end, but there were like many women who doesn't sit around the table. They were all sitting outside. And I keep on saying, please sit on, you know, around the table. And they were like, oh, no, no, it's okay. We'll sit at the back. That is actually not the fault of the man. That is the fault of the woman because you have you feel of sitting around the table with the man. You choose to sit at the back. I agree, but it's also, it's beyond, it's, be, it's the fault of the society because we are taught like from a very young age that, you know, we should apologize all the time and be discreet and we shouldn't like, if you ask for a promotion when you're a woman, you're aggressive. I mean, it's just, and so on and so forth. It's yeah. a cultural, it's a cultural matter, matter and it's, it's true in the UN too. And that is what Cheryl Sanders has been telling the woman, visibility and the ability to bring yourself forward, but with respect and with brain. Exactly. Uh, and there's another book very quickly that's wonderful and fascinating to read. It's called Invisible Women by Caroline Kriez. Oh, I cannot pronounce her name, but I can, for those of you who are interested, I'm happy to share the reference later. And it's exactly about that. It's about like uh, gender stereotypes and, and, and cultural bias, etc. And it's very illuminating. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, panelists, for those insights. Um, with that, we've come to the end of our poll. Uh, on, on behalf of uh, Global Compact Malaysia and Tulips, uh, I would like to thank all the participants, our fellow panelists, and especially the Tulips uh, who have participated in this session. And we also encourage everyone here to uh, look at our women empowerment principles uh, and, you know, and see how you can adopt this in your organizations. Uh, and we remain... Uh, uh, at your at, at your disposal if you need more information and more uh, this, uh, uh, insights into how we can do this. So again, please join me for a virtual applause. Sorry, you only can do virtual. Virtual applause to all our uh, panelists. Uh, before we go, uh, this is an opportunity for you all to come on camera because we would like to take a group photo. Uh, uh, we'll try our I mean, We'll see whether uh, Teams oh, allows the, the Zoom like group photo. My but, hair. but it's okay. Everyone, <laughs> let's just Turn your cameras. Let's see how uh, how that goes, and then uh, we'll take a step, and then we'll call it a day, and we can enjoy the rest the rest of our Labor Day. Yes, yes, please. Uh, uh, Sharwin, can you can you uh, guide Sharwin Afif? Can you can you walk us through the group photo? Need to see your face, that <laughs> They will send you a picture. <laughs> okay. Uh, can all of you turn on your cameras, Farus? Can you please turn on your camera? Is this possible? Uh, yeah, you can. We can get the ones at the bottom, right? Can everyone turn on your cameras now, please? Teams only allow uh, maximum four pictures. Ah, uh, I see. Unfortunately, yeah. Teams Unfortunately. doesn't allow the, yeah. the the group like like Zoom. So yeah. we apologize for that. So, uh, thank you very much. What this this webinar is recorded. We will share the links to uh, everyone. Uh, so you also get to double check the name of the books and the resources that were shared. Uh, and. We also welcome you to our future webinars and we'll keep everybody in the loop. With that, thank you very much. Again, thank you to our fellow panelists and Dato Moderator. Any last last uh, words? I'm good, thank you. And uh, have a good day. And uh, Odd, it's time for you to go to bed <laughs> and back to the kids. So if the kids so- sleep, I will. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Happy Labor Day. 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 Yes. Bye bye. Bye, Carlos. Thanks, guys. Right. Thank you. Thank you.